Thank you for joining us today. I want to welcome everyone to this special STS ISHLT webinar, HVAD is off the market, now what? On behalf of STS, I want to thank the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation for their collaboration and support of today's session. Please note this webinar is being recorded and will be available tomorrow morning on the STS website and STS YouTube channel. At this time, I am pleased to welcome our moderator for today's session, Dr. Frank Pagani from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Dr. Pagani, welcome, and let me turn it over to you. Thank you. I'd like to welcome uh, everyone to our uh, Society of Thoracic Surgeon and International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation webinar on the HVAT is off the market, now what? I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel um, this afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jennifer Calger, who's from the Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, Michigan. From Medtronic, I'd like to introduce Dr. Peter Capitan, and also include Dr. Armand Kilich from the Medical University of South Carolina, Dr. Robert Cormos from Abbott, Dr. Nahash Mokadam from the Ohio State uh, University, and Dr. Dayara Saeed from the Leipzig Heart Center in Leipzig, Germany. This, uh, this afternoon, we will review a recent decision by Medtronic to remove the HVAD uh, from commercial uh, availability. And our thought, our, our objective is really to provide information to physicians and to our patients on um, the next steps in terms of care and, and some of the goals of, 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 of care for uh, uh, all, all alternative treatments. So I'd like to start off um, by really first um, asking uh, for some perspective and let me turn to Dr. Nahush Mokadam, and, and perhaps uh, you can just provide us with an overview of your thoughts on the issue. Um, how, how have you interacted with your patients? How has it affected your, your program? Um, and, and please uh, share that with us. Uh, thank you, Frank, and thank you to the STS and ISHLT uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, this is obviously changing our landscape considerably, and uh, as many of us feel uh, this uh, came as uh, some bit of a surprise uh, and certainly a surprise to our patients and their families. Uh, I think the good news is that uh, we have a, a great alternative pump uh, that's really available in the market uh, and uh, it is not under any clinical trial restrictions or anything like that. I think that's very reassuring because if this had happened several years prior, our industry could have been really left in a lurch. Um, I think our patients uh, have been appropriately reassured, and I think they're going to need ongoing reassurance uh, that uh, the patients that have HVAT support uh, are still safe, uh, they're still healthy, uh, we're going to continue to take care of them, and we're going to talk about some of those challenges and uh, opportunities that we have in their care today uh, throughout this panel. I think it would be important to hear from uh, Dr. Saeed and, and provide us with a European perspective. The HVAD pump was used uh, quite a bit more in Europe, and how has it this impacted uh, your program uh, and, and, and in Europe in general? Thank you, Frank, and um, thanks ISSOT and STAs for the opportunity to be here. Well, obviously, um, European centers were shocked with this decision because it was kind of unexpected. And as you already know, Hardware used to have 70% to 80% from European market. And even up to recently, they were down a little bit, but it was still like 30%. There are more than like eight to 10 heart centers in Europe. They just use HVAD. For that reason, I think, or pediatric population, I think um, the issue is, uh, as uh, Nahush already mentioned, we have a good pump, alternative pump, but I think still, HVAS was for some um, patients' population the, a good pump and very um, advisable, at least for some patients' populations. And um, um, some centers which predominantly use HVAS, they need to switch. And there are still some tips and tricks which we will share today and uh, with the audience. And we'll come to this point soon. But um, I think. Um, we're still in the process of getting this information um, 
gradually to, to our head and to accept it, this decision, yes. Thank you, Dr. Saeed. What we'd like to do next, you know, one of the, the recommendations that was provided by Medtronic was that the HVAD pump not be replaced electively uh, without cause. And we turn to the Intermax registry to try to provide uh, some sub data to uh, look at that uh, recommendation to provide support to that recommendation if uh, possible. Uh, we have some data that we would like to share with uh, our, our physicians and, and, and view viewers that would help put some of that uh, recommendation in perspective. And uh, so I may have the first slide. So really the goal of this uh, research question, this is data that was obtained from the uh, Society of Thoracic Surgeons Intermax Registry. The analysis was performed by the uh, Intermax Data Coordinating Center at the University of Alabama at Birmingham under the guidance of Dr. James Kirkland. Um, the goal of the, really this uh, research question was to assess the operative risk and long-term survival for patients undergoing an HVAD to HeartMate 3 exchange based on the experience in Intermax. And we want to compare the operative and long-term risk of undergoing an HVAD to a HeartMate 3 LVAD exchange to the risk of remaining on support with an HVAD system. Next slide, please. So we looked at uh, if the study cohort consisted of adult patients only, uh, it, it, we looked at primary de novo implantations of the HVAD system and we also looked at additional cohorts of patients undergoing HVAD to HeartMate 3 exchange. And we excluded any other types of durable mechanical circulatory support. Next slide. What we did um, with, to match patients' cohorts, we looked at uh, all uh, HVAD primary implants from 2017 to 2021 to match the cohort in which um, HVAD to HeartMate 3s were exchanged. Exchange. So these are similar time cohorts. Uh, we do not go back further in terms of looking at outcomes for the HVAD prior to 2017. The median time on uh, HVAD support for all patients in the study cohort was uh, approximately one year. And for the median time on support with the second device was approximately 14 months for the heart, uh, HVAD to HeartMate 3 and then eight months for the HVAD to HVAD. What you're looking at here in the red line is the observed Kaplan-Meier survival for patients undergoing a primary HVAD implantation. The blue line is the uh, predicted survival for that cohort using a parametric model. The black line represents the hazard function. So an initial early high hazard and a, and a remaining low or constant hazard uh, following uh, the initial three months. Next, we looked at the uh, survival for patients undergoing an HVAD to HeartMate 3 exchange. The, blue, the red line represents the actual observed survival. The blue line represents the parametric, parametric modeling survival. And the black line represents the hazard uh, with a high early hazard going a re, a dropping to a constant hazard. Longest follow-up in this cohort was 42 months. If you place the, um, par the expected survival with an HVAD is represented in the black line. And so that is support on an HVAD device. If you superimpose that um, the survival for an H HVAD to HeartMate 3 exchange, and for, and for this um, modeling, we, uh, we modeled this exchange at six months during the uh, initial constant uh, hazard phase of the HVAD survival curve, you can see that the HVAD to HeartMate 3 exchange is associated with an early uh, mortality hazard. And, there's, and the dashed lines represent the 75% confidence interval. So the data suggests that there is no survival benefit to undergoing an elective HVAD to HeartMate 3 exchange as opposed to remaining on the uh, current uh, HVAD device, a normally functioning HVAD device. Next uh, slide, please. If you look at the initial six months of that, so it's the previous slide and we've expanded the uh, axes now to look at the early um, year survival in there. There's actually 
uh, evidence to suggest that undergoing this exchange may have more, more uh, may have a mortality uh, effect as opposed to staying on the initial HVAD device. And so this is data to suggest that an elective exchange is likely not beneficial uh, uh, in this situation and that remaining on an HVAD is probably important. Next slide. These data, um, and let me turn your attention to the slide on the right. These data are the uh, Kaplan-Meier survival curves for patients undergoing an HVAD to HeartMate 3 exchange in the um, red and an HVAD to HVAD exchange in the blue. And I turn your attention to the early three months where the mortality uh, effect um, or survival is similar for patients undergoing an HVAD to HVAD exchange and, and patients undergoing an HVAD to HeartMate 3 exchange. There, is, there appears to be no um, uh, short or shortcoming to undergoing a HeartMate or HVAD to HeartMate 3 exchange. In other words, the mortality effect of that exchange is not greater than an HVAD to HVAD exchange. In fact, long-term benefit may be better after receiving the HeartMate 3 than after receiving a HVAD um, exchange. So this uh, should reassure physicians and patients that re the requirement for an HVAD uh, HeartMate 3 exchange does not increase the morbidity of the operation. So patient risk is significantly higher in the first six months following exchange and survival in the first three months following HVAD exchange to another HVAD or HeartMate 3 device is similar. So patients are not disadvantaging by limiting an HVAD exchange to the HeartMate 3 device. So based on this analysis, the evidence does not support a recommendation for elective exchange of HVAD to HeartMate 3. Uh, we recommend continued follow-up of patients on the HVAD device, and we recommend an interval analysis should be planned to guide future decisions. Thank you. I would like to uh, turn the next question to Dr. Calger. Dr. Calger, perhaps you can give us some insight on um, the differences in really the medical management of the patients, how this decision would, would potentially affect your care of patients with an HVAD. And, and for centers that are not familiar with the HVAD device or, or the HeartMate 3 device, what's some of the you know, considerations in, in, in management of these patients? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the first um, aspect of the question is, you know, how do we monitor patients currently on HVAD? And, and many of us have patients that are doing fine, um, that have been on HVAD for many years. Um, so how are we going to handle those individuals um, to ensure safety? So um, I think one of the important markers is following the factors that we know that are of increased risk with HVAD patients, most namely stroke. So these patients, when they come into clinic, we're going to follow their interrogation logs closely and follow those short and very importantly, long-term trends in power to make sure that we're not starting to see upticks in power or equally important, slowly, slow decrements in flow. Um, and as we know, for patients on an HVAD, um, two important factors came out of clinical trial data. One is anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy. So, you know, maintaining those patients on high dose aspirin and making sure that those INRs are therapeutic at two to three. So we're going to be very vigorous in monitoring those INRs with our individual anticoagulation systems. Um, and then the second facet of that for HVAD is blood pressure control, um, because we know blood pressure at our hypertension um, is, an, is increased afterload for the pump, just like for the native heart. So that reduces flow and flow is equivalent to stasis. So we wanna keep those mean arterial pressures close to 90 as possible to reduce the risk of stroke and pump thrombosis. Now, the caveat to this is as we extend this knowledge from HVAD, which has contributed a lot of wonderful knowledge to the community on how we manage our patients on an LVAD, we need to also simultaneously separate device management from the HeartMate 2, the HVAD, and the HeartMate 3. And I think that's really important for um, factors such as blood pressure control, um, how we're interpreting a blood pressure in clinic uh, for an HVAD patient and a HeartMate 3 patient that has a degree of intrinsic pulsatility 
can be very different. Um, you know, for most HVAD patients, their pulse pressures aren't high. So we can interpret that Doppler opening pressure as their mean arterial pressure and really aim for that value less than 90. But for the HeartMate 3 patient that many of whom, not all, but many of whom have some degree of a pulse pressure, if we interpret every Doppler opening pressure as a map, we run the risk of inducing hypotension. And when, when we induced hypotension, especially in a patient who's volume deplete, we're going to have low flows, we're going to have dizziness, and we're going to have unwell patients. Um, so I think going forward as physicians, we need to think about the patient and that particular device and how we're managing that device rather than treating all continuous flow patients the same. What about in terms of how have you interacted with your patients and informed them of, of the decision and, and future uh, impact of this decision? Yeah, so in all patients at our center received a letter um, explaining um, the issues at hand. And then very importantly, and I think uh, probably the most important is that time in clinic uh, where the practitioner sits down with the patient and just has a face-to-face -face discussion about what does this mean? Um, you know, we treat this no differently than any other device recall or device issue um, reassurance that uh, we're going to monitor them closely, that we're going to do them justice, and we're going to make sure that they're they're that we're doing everything we can to keep them well on device support. And I think even more importantly is that while complication rates have been shown to be higher with HVAD, mo most of these patients are doing very very well. So if we just encourage them that um, you know those that are doing well will hopefully continue to do well and we'll support them through um, and try to keep that, um, keep them going in a positive trajectory. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next, I think really important talk, topic we really um, want to uh, review is that of the actual technical aspects of uh, HVAD to HeartMate 3 exchange. Um, there are important considerations and, and we'll, I'd like to have Dr. Kilich maybe comment on on what are your what you know what are some of the important aspects of that and and give us your thoughts on the subject. Sure. So I think um, just like any patient that's being considered for exchange, that preoperative imaging with a CT scan of the chest with contrast is very important to delineate the indication for exchange. In cases such as device infection uh, with mediastinitis, uh, I would recommend a sternotomy and explantation of all the device components. Um, and then in cases of uh, where, the, where the issue is limited to the pump itself, such as pump thrombosis, a thoracotomy approach is reasonable and very feasible in, in that uh, regard, including an HVAD to HeartMate 3 exchange. When discussing where to put the, the new sewing ring of the HeartMate 3, I think there's a few options. So one would be that when you explant uh, and you remove the sewing ring of the HVAD, you can go in through the same site. And essentially that turns into a cut and sew technique basically, where you already have the ventriculotomy from the prior VAD. Um, and then you obviously wanna inspect the left ventricular cavity and make sure you remove any panis um, or any potential particulate matter in there so it doesn't embolize. And once it's cleaned out, then you can do your uh, sutures and, and, and uh, you know, seat the uh, sewing ring of the HeartMate 3 and implant the device. If it is done through a thoracotomy approach, you can absolutely do a, a graft to graft anastomosis. Your, um, you know, once you're on cardiopulmonary bypass and you clamp your original outflow graft of the HVAD, um, you know, a question that comes up is there is a size mismatch. So the outflow graft of the HVAD is 10 millimeters and it's 14 millimeters for HeartMate 3, but that can be very easily addressed with just appropriate spacing of sutures when you do an out, outflow graft to graft anastomosis. The other option is to actually um, take out the sewing ring of the HVAD, close that ventriculotomy site and seat the uh, new sewing ring of the HeartMate 3 at a, at a different site, a few centimeters away. And finally, there is a technique that's been described where the sewing ring of the HVAD is actually left in place and a rubber seal is placed around the inflow cannula of the HeartMate 3 and it's actually seated inside the sewing ring of the HVAD to prevent leakage of uh, blood from the left ventricular cavity. And I would say that's sort of experimental and only been done in a few cases, but that is another option that's probably gonna be considered more often now that we may be doing more HVAD to HeartMate 3 um, exchanges. 
uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Mokandam and Dr. Say, could you comment on your experiences with the exchange technique? As already mentioned from Armin, there is like these techniques. Another possible technique is just to use the, to put the serine ring of heart mercury on the age vast serine ring. So this is also another additional technique that you put it on and you uh, have already a serine ring and you put the other one on the top of it. And in that case, you can put the pump in. And again, there is two options as already mentioned, but I think there are some other um, differences at the implantation when you go for a less invasive technique, if you use a heart my three versus HVAT. Percentage who I used to uh, implant HVAT per minimal invasive technique, they need to know a lot of like differences between these two pumps. But for particular importance is the a severing of um, ARCMA3. So especially for LIS technique, it should be perfectly fit on the LV apex because otherwise the pump will not um, um, be in position when you put the pump in. The other thing is, for example, the outlet side of the ARCMA3 for the alpha graph. So the direction of the alpha graph is very, very important. We usually mark that the alpha graph place before we put the pericardial stitches so that we can know where the alpha graph will be going to because otherwise you will run into a problem when the pump is sitting in that the pump must might be misaligned and not be aligned toward the uh, mitral valve. And the other thing is also for the less invasive implant of the heart rate team, we usually don't put the bend reef on the pump unless we put the pump inside and we at the end of the procedure before we close the thoracotomy, we put the bend uh, relief on. So otherwise you will end up having a huge incision thoracotomy syringe so that you can put the pump in. And um, that's uh, some tips when you go for a less invasive heart mercury implantation. Um, a couple of other observations um, uh, for, for those of, of you on the, on the call today that remember doing a HeartMate 2 uh, exchange to a HeartMate 3 or HVAD, uh, the HeartMate 2 cup was intramyocardial, uh, the way it was placed, and actually was a little bit more difficult to dig out uh, than the, uh, the HVAD sewing cup because it's an epicardial system, uh, just like the HeartMate 3. So in fact, the HVAD to HeartMate 3 exchange is easier than a HeartMate 2 exchange to either a HeartMate 3 or a, uh, an HVAD. Um, so I, I think people will be uh, uh, pleasantly surprised when, uh, when this becomes necessary. Um, also mentioned is that the, the HeartMate 3 is a larger pump than the HVAT. And that does come into play uh, in the minimally invasive approach. Typically you do need a larger incision uh, just to fit the pump in. And as importantly, uh, because it's got that quick connect uh, lining up the quick connect uh, can sometimes be challenging for those of you who have not done HeartMate 3 through a, a small incision before. Um, uh, but it can be done. Uh, typically, you need another centimeter or so of incision to accomplish it. it. It doesn't mean you have to double your incision if you go through a thoracotomy approach. Uh, I, I completely agree with uh, Dr. Kilich that uh, a 14 millimeter or 10 millimeter graft is easily done. Uh, it will be more challenging though, if you've left the entire HVAD bend relief in place at the time of your original implant, um, because that will all need to be dissected free prior to making an anastomosis. There is um, two points I'd like to just raise for more discussion. Um, you mentioned you, you know, sewing, uh, doing an end-to-end -end, um, graph. So the HeartMate 3 is a 14 millimeter graph going to a 10 millimeter graph. Do you think um, in an optimal circumstance that uh, represent, could represent some outflow obstruction to the H HeartMate 3 and should the entire um, outflow uh, graph be replaced? And two, um, in terms of leaving the HVAD um, apical cuff um, and putting on a HeartMate 3 cuff, apical cuff over that, is there some misalignment or some uh, you know, potential concern with that technique, and should we, you know, standardize the operation, you know, replace all of the uh, outflow graft, and make sure that we're removing all the apical, um, con you know, the apical connector, and replacing it with the um, 
part me three apical cuff. Uh, let me let me take on that first question, and I'll, and I'll leave uh, the second question, Dr. Saeed. Um, I, I'm I'm glad that uh, Dr. Cormos is on the phone um, from from Abbott because I, I would encourage Abbott to do HQ curves uh, with a, a 14 to 10 millimeter uh, graft and see what they get because I think uh, we'll learn something from that because I think it's a relevant comment. Uh, honestly, we can obviously run 10 liters of flow through an HVAD, so I don't think the, the graft itself will be flow limiting, but I'm sure the pump will notice in some way. I, I guess I'd ask Dr. Cormos what he thinks. Well, um, I've heard a lot of variations on some themes here that I can tell you will generate probably some uh, guidance from us in the very near future about some of these points. I think standardizing the procedure has considerable merit. Nohush, I think you're very perceptive. Um, this this um, question of what happens to the HQ curve we've discussed with Kevin Bork, there's no doubt that it will change the HQ properties of the heart mate three. So, um, you know, we haven't done that study. It's perhaps one that we should try in, in, uh, in the lab, but you know, for now, um, not knowing that, my first inclination would be to replace the whole graft. But again, we're in a learning phase here, so I, I can't be adamant, but that's, that's kind of how I feel about that. Peter, maybe you could comment on, on you know, what, what you believe is, you know, the approach for the exchange in terms of those two issues. Um. Yes, thank you very much, Frank. Um, so yeah, replacing the pump, of course, you know, leaving the HVAD ring on the electrical apex uh, seems, um, it looks attractive uh, to decrease the, the tissue damage that you can get if by removing it. But on the other hand, um, it may also create some more leakage around the ring if you put the heart rate three ring on top of the HVAD ring. So if it's possible, yeah, if you can remove it, um, I would say try to do that uh, and put a new H heart made three ring uh, on the apex. Similar for the alpha graft, the the end to end anastomosis uh, is, looks very nice and favorable and can speed up the procedure, uh, especially when you have done a left thoracotomy instead of a sternotomy. Um, but again, you know you have this um, this difference in in uh, diameter, which may cause an issue with the heart made three pump. But as Bob just mentioned, you know. That's something they have to find out to you know, what kind of effect it will have. And we understand that the, the procedure will be more extensive than exchanging an HVAT for an HVAT. I, I, I also like to, you know, things happen ironically sometimes. And we just received a report of um, a pump exchange that was done using, you know, a rubber glove tip around the inflow cannula. And uh, six months later, there was a fairly large pseudoaneurysm that developed yeah. uh, that ruptured. And so I, again, I would probably stay away from that technique, not knowing how well that seats. Yeah. Well, I, I think I can add also something. First of all, as we all know, these patients are really sick patients. The, uh, the most important thing is we have to make sure that patients who are staying home safe with uh, h valve. As Dr. Pagani already mentioned, there is no reason to bring him, to bring him back to the hospital to an exchange. The pump is running well, it's pretty well. And the other thing is, um, um, concerning different techniques, I really appreciate that if there is any way of standardizing the technique because there is different ways of doing it. I personally think the less we do for this patient, the better they are. So I, that's why I thought just putting the cuff on the cuff, the most important thing here is that the cuff fit exactly. So you have to use, the, when you use the previous cuff, that uh, avoid using any sort of rubber that may end up in pump from balls or anything like that. But this worked out pretty well, but the alignment should be perfect. So there should be no irregularities in the cuff of, or the sewing ring of the heart mate when you put it on the LV or the new sewing ring so that the pump will fit in. And I use that like four or five times without any issues. So I can encourage using that technique. I'll bring up another uh, technical uh, situation. Um, what about um, the use of the HeartMate 3 in adults with small body sizes? And, and you know, what are the you know, implications for primary implant? You know, how small can we 
you know, comfortably go in, in an adult patient with small body size? And then what are the implications in, a, in an exchange in a patient with a small body size? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, for the momentum trial, I believe the, the cutoff for BSA was 1.2. I mean, I know we've done a few that are not quite as low as 1.2, but less than 1.5. I think in patients that have a, a small chest cavity, there's a couple of technical tips. Um, one, and this would be whether they're small BSA or not, is, is uh, taking down the pericardium um, down to the level or just above the phrenic nerve. Um, I do routinely get into the left pleural space and try to seat the pump into the left costophrenic gutter. Sometimes I've noticed that, um, particularly if they're small BSA patients, that when you close the chest, it, there can be a dynamic change in that inflow cannula and it can start shifting towards the septum. And so some folks, including myself, have described tacking the, the pump to the uh, chest wall. And I think that could be done one of two ways. Um, one option would be to place your uh, suture um, you know, endothoracic inside the chest cavity and try to get it around the pump and then tie it down to seat it and secure it to the chest wall. The other option would be to make a counter incision in the left uh, 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 costal region, subcostal region, and actually pass a suture through that counter incision, put it around the pump, like where the bend relief is or right where the outflow cannula is coming out, and then tie that through the counter incision and close it. And that can sometimes help shift the pump up and align the inflow cannula better with the uh, ventricular septum as well, um, and particularly sort of fixate it to that chest wall so that there's less of a dynamic change with closure. Frank, I, I think we, we get into more trouble with small ventricles than we do with small people. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, we, we've been fairly uh, successful, uh, all programs have, and even fitting HeartMate twos into small BSA people. Um, and so I, I think we, we kind of find a way to do it, whether it's a costophrenic uh, gutter, whether it's intra-abdominal uh, and, and go through the diaphragm. There's lots of ways to seat the pump and fit it inside of a body. As long as you have an adequate size chamber of a heart, uh, it, it'll give you enough flexibility to be able to find a different angle to get it in. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, um, I, I guess I'll be the one to quote uh, Bud Frazier, putting it on the diaphragmatic surface of the left ventricle will also work even in small BSA people. I think we also have a lot to learn from our pediatric colleagues to this regard. Um, I think there are probably going to be some dedicated um, educational discussions for pediatrics coming up here, but um, they've managed to fit um, these pumps into very small people. And um, the other uh, population would be in Japan. I, I know that they're a very um, heavy HVAD program, but certainly um, they've been uh, they have some of the smallest um, body surface areas publications out there. Um, and then just a plug for Dr. Molina, I think he, he will have a paper upcoming here looking at Momentum 3 data in pa patients of smaller body surface area um, um, that will give us a little bit of insight into outcomes in this particular patient profile. Are there any tricks in terms of management in patients with small I mean, the post-operative management, um, Dr. Calgar, I mean, what, what, are there special considerations for the patient with the small ventricle or the small small body size? Yeah, I, I really do think the small ventricle is the key discussion. Um, certainly, they do go hand in hand. There's a correlation, but we also have many small people with big hearts. Um, there have been some analyses uh, by Dr. Nyack, who I think is still down at Emory, looking at... Um, outcomes um, according to BSA, uh, which the large proportion of those were women, and the increased risk of RV dysfunction um, with the hypothesis that a lot of it has to do with the ventricular and interdependence pulling of that septum um, uh, of affecting how the, the longitudinal contraction of the right ventricle um, performs. So as we think about the smaller ventricles and therefore smaller BSA patients, um, we need to really use our, our, our other means of, um, of managing flow. So rather than the knee-jerk reaction of turning up pump speed to achieve the, the flow that you want, make sure that your afterload is controlled. 
be mindful of preload. You know, some of these patients that um, have very good functioning right ventricles can have a propensity for dehydration on bad support. So um, make sure that we're addressing preload, make sure we're addressing afterload. And I, I, I do, th being a non-surgeon with a big asterisk there, um, I do think inflow position is, is really important so that we're not pulling on that septum. Um, not only is it not good for the right ventricle, both short and long-term, um, but because you can you know, have occlusion of the inflow um, um, from any wall, including the septum, um, and that can make long-term management challenging. I just want to mention a, a um, comment from Dr. David Rosenthal, who's a pedi pediatrician, a pediatric cardiologist uh, from Stanford. He mentions that small adults may only pose problems captured by heart size. Smaller children pose problems related to thoracic size as well as flow rates needed. And, and that's obviously important, uh, important differentiation between small adults and, and children. Um, the other question, um, and there's another comment from the audience, or, uh, audience that I want to get to, but um, what, um, Dr. Cagher, what about um, the issue of heart transplantation in, in some of these patients on, and, and please others comment, uh, heart transplantation on, um, for patients on an HVAD, is there any way of prioritizing? What is the current field doing, you know, looking into that issue? Yeah. So, um, you know, as, as best as I know, um, right now, um, you know, UNOS does offer uh, the UNOS um, a complication um, criteria, UNOS 2 and UNOS 3 for the various complications. And I think that patients that are having those high risk complications, such as, you know, the pump failure to restart, um, are, that's going to be your avenue for getting that patient transplanted quickly. Do I know at this time of any um, intent to expedite um, a listed HVAD patient? I don't. I know that um, UNOS is, is looking at the wait list very closely and they're monitoring outcomes. And my um, understanding with just a brief discussion with Dr. Hall today is that they're, they're staying on top of that very, very closely. Um, but we'll just continue to rely on our current um, allocation system at this time. I can talk about the um, yes. European perspective on that. Um, so back in January, when this first issue started with the pump restarting, when you exchange the controller, at that time, there were a lot of discussion in Germany about putting these patients. So we identified the serial numbers and we end up finding from 12 to 14 patients who were affected and they were bridge to transplant patients. So, and the decision at that time was made that selected patients could be tried to be put on the high urgency list. So we end up in labs, putting from all of, we had like three patients and one of them, we end up putting him on the high urgency list and transplanting this patient. But at this point, there is no kind of uh, prioritization for this patient. And I talked today to UK colleagues, I was talking to Stefan Schuler, and also UK transplant, they will not prioritize these patients. So that being said, based on the fact that these patients are running well and staying home, there is no reason to bring them to the hospital and transplant them as soon as possible. But there are some sort of modification for example, the company HVAD, so um, Medtronic um, recommends every change of control every two years, but some institutions started doing, developing new protocol. For example, there are some that they will not do that. So um, they will not exchange the, the controller just prophylactically. And if we need to do this, they have specialized protocol putting the patient on a, for example, having an ECMO in the background, if there's anything, um, um, if the patient is doing bad, then they will put the patient on ECMO. But uh, that's how it is right now. Thank you. Um, so I just want to um, change uh, sort of direction a little bit. I want to, um, and we have about uh, 20 minutes remaining. I would like to uh, give uh, both Dr. Capitan and Dr. Cormos time to to comment on the on the on the uh, the situation and and perhaps. 
Um, also, uh, Peter, if um, you know, there is a question from the um, um, from the uh, audience and asking about uh, specific knowledge about specific lot numbers and and so forth, and where could we get their uh, the serial numbers of affected devices and where they could get that information and and so uh, please. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, very relevant question. Um, and so the the stop start failure um, is um, the, for which we did a field corrective action last December. A letter was sent to all physicians that had patients uh, with this higher risk of the stop start failure, which is occurring in about a rate of 5% um, in a specific lot of pumps. And all these physicians that have patients with this specific number of pumps uh, that have this higher instance of start failure, they have been informed. So they are aware of it if they have a patient uh, that has this pump implanted. Then beside this specific lot, for which we found the root cause. Um, there's the 0.4% incidence of the stop start failure. So four out of thousand implants can experience this as well, for which we don't know what the root cause is. And actually that was the, one of the major reasons why we took the device from the market. Um, the instance is so low that it's also hard to find the root cause. Um, because sometimes, you know, when this happens, of course, it has a detrimental effect on the patient because if the patient is completely dependent on the flow, the patient will die. But if there's no autopsy and you don't get a pump returned, um, you can imagine that it's very hard to find the reason for the stop-start um, failure. But we do know that it occurred outside this specific lot. But again, those patients that have a higher incidence of the stop-start failure, they have been informed. So these lot numbers are known and are communicated to the physicians and patients. Bob, any comments uh, in terms of from the perspective of Abbott? Uh, thank you, Frank. And again, thanks to the STS and ISHLT for giving us this opportunity to join this panel. Rest assured, uh, this is not a time for celebration. You know, the community of industry partners is rather small and we've all learned how to work with each other. Uh, more importantly, um, we rely on the collaboration of physician visionaries, nurses, scientists, engineers, clinical trial specialists, federal funding agencies. Everybody has worked together to solve this terrible heart failure crisis that we're facing. I could tell you what this does for Abbott is it places an immense weight of responsibility on our shoulders. And we've had to assure the Food and Drug Administration, for example, that the supply chain will not be broken. And that I, I can tell you that that is one of our top priorities and, and we're comfortable that globally we can, we can keep up with that supply chain demand. Um, we are very much aware that these patients are not HVAD patients, they're not HeartMate 3 patients, they're family members, they're, they're children, parents, brothers and sisters who have a crippling disease. And, and it's our job to try to figure out how to make their lives better. And besides now, our focus is, is besides providing new technology. And I can assure you that the conversations about what's in the pipeline and what's coming down the pipeline have been accelerated at, at a very high rate, given the importance of providing the best technology that we can for patients. But it's more than just technology. It's also how can we get the most out of the current technology? And we have a number of <clears throat> quality improvement initiatives that will begin uh, in the coming year where we can begin to understand why we have centers that do as well as they, they do with our technology and bring that level up across and educate everybody on how we can get consistent results, even with what we're using today. <clears throat> so we're very vested in, in the success of the therapy. We're vested in communicating with our physician and clinician partners how to best do that. And we really look to you to communicate with us what your needs are. I mean, I've heard from a lot of you, but we wanna hear directly. You can reach out to me, Phil Adamson, any of our, our partners, and please tell us what we can do to help. We've learned a tremendous amount, and Jennifer's been on the calls with the small patient forums that we've had in the last year. We've learned a tremendous amount from our pediatric surgeons and clinicians. And again, we're going to have to focus on that at another time because their needs 
are critical and specific, but they can add to what we learn in how we use these pumps in small adults. And there'll be another manuscript coming out very shortly that summarizes uh, those meetings that uh, Jennifer and others had on what are the tips and tricks for those small patients. So um, we're, we're looking at this from a very humble perspective because I've been, you know, many of you know me as a clinician. I've been through a lot of phases of this and you can only be humble because things change so rapidly. And I have to, you know, Peter and I have become very close in the last couple of weeks and I respect Peter and Medtronic immensely because, you know, it's a whisker away. Things can change so quickly and we have an enormous responsibility. So thank you all. Um, if there are question and answers, Frank, I guess you'll take it from here. Thank, thank you, Bob. We have a, a number of questions coming in um, and I'll just start off um, with some of them. Uh, so for our surgeons on, on, the, on the panel, um, has any published data on the technical aspects of the operation, the HVAD to HeartMate 3 uh, has been published, any less, you know, that could provide lessons learned, unique tips. Um, if there isn't anything published, should we uh, provide some guidance, uh, perhaps uh, getting together and forming a best practices sort of compendium of, of that could help surgeons uh, with the implant procedure and also um, cardiologists with the management of these patients? I'm not aware of any publications. Um, I, I think it is a reasonable idea um, uh, for uh, a group of people to get together and write down a, a series of tips and tricks for if and when this happens. Um, but again, we're, you know, we're, we're anticipating this not happening a whole lot. This is, we're not recommending, right. nobody is recommending electively changing these pumps out. So hopefully this will remain a rare event uh, for most people. And um, uh, so it, it would be helpful to have tips and tricks because uh, hopefully nobody will have a broad experience in it. Right. I mean, just, just to emphasize that point, uh, uh, is that we only were able to identify 45 patients from 2017 to 2020 that underwent an HVAD to HeartMe3 exchange. So it's, you know, the, the um, and then the number of exchanges was, you know, for HVAD exchange for the total number of patients that received an HVAD exchange um, with an HVAD uh, was still small relative to total implants. So you are right that the numbers are small. Um, a question for Dr. Calger. Um, you mentioned that uh, there, uh, to watch for a slow decline in flows for the HVAD patients. Uh, what are you looking for and what actions do you take when that occurs? Yeah, so, um, you know, there, there, are, there are two ways that you can have pump flow changes. One is acute, whether it's ingestion of thrombus, um, either within the inflow or within the pump. Um, and that's usually pretty dramatic, right? Patients are sick, um, a sudden change in symptoms, um, usually associated with alarms, high watts, because clot is, it, when clot is on the rotor, that's friction. Um, if you have slow drops in flow, um, you know, we, we are starting to see in all pumps, HeartMe3 and, and HVAD, you know, some outflow issues that can occur, uh, especially for um, practices that, um, including ours, that still wrap the outflow graft. So um, being cognizant of what a patient's prior normal was in terms of flow and in terms of power, um, and not just looking back at the last clinic visit three months ago, but looking back at the clinic visit a year, year and a half ago, I think is very, very important because um, when patients start to show declines in flow, recrudescent heart failure symptoms, increased Lasix requirements, it may not just be their right ventricle that's a problem. We, we may need to look into the pump itself. So that's what I meant by that. Thank you. Um, just some comments from our uh, audience uh, Professor Potapov has mentioned that Dr. Schmidow has published uh, from Hanover has published information on exchange in 2018. And Dr. Mira from uh, Boston has mentioned uh, a first series of left ventricular assist device exchanges to HeartMate 3 published by Dr. Henke in the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery in 2017. So there is some data available uh, on the exchanges. So thank you from, from um, 
uh, Evgeny and, and, and Mandeep with that information. So I think we're coming close to the, um, to the hour. I, I'd like to just uh, end this by uh, maybe getting some final thoughts from the panel, uh, in, including uh, Bob and, and, and Peter. Uh, uh, I'll let Peter go first. Uh, if, if there's any particular uh, issues we missed or addressed or just things that uh, you wanna, want to want to mention. Yeah, thank you, Frank, and and yeah, I think you know for this uh, this webinar because it's so important. You know, with Medtronic, we realized that the impact for patients is the, the greatest, and then also for physicians that have to communicate this to patients. Uh, we realized that you know when you write this dear doctor letter that you inform physicians, but the hardest conversation, of course, is when physicians have to talk with their patients. So, what we want to stress is that we want to do everything that we can to still support those patients who are on an HVAT. And it's about more than 4,000 currently worldwide, uh, about 50% in the US and about 50% in, in outside the US. And so we will provide peripherals, et cetera, as long as we can, um, as long as needed, I will say. Um, and, and we realize that could be eight, nine years from now that there are still patients out there that are in HVAT and we want to provide all the support that we can. So we also um, you know, have a patient management advisory panel uh, with uh, physicians, with surgeons, cardiologists, and also vet coordinators that can help us in advising uh, physicians that have questions around, for example, the exchange, uh, how to do it technically, how to take care of patients, how to you know, take care of blood pressure management and INR management to reduce the risk that those patients have. We acknowledge in the papers that came out of the SCS Intermax database that the stroke rate is higher with HVAT. That was one of our concerns and one of the reasons why we took this action. And we want to reduce that risk of stroke as much as we can. And so, um, yeah, be assured that uh, we really love to get all the advice that we can to uh, manage patients as, as best as, as we can. We, we, we acknowledge the impact. And I'm also grateful to Bob Cormos which one of, was one of the first uh, that we informed about this, this issue because we wanted to, so wanted to make sure that there's enough pumps available uh, from Abbott that uh, can fill the gap here. Uh, the other thing what we did is we reached out to uh, Berlin Heart because we also acknowledged that in the small pediatric population, the age vet was popular because of the size. And uh, we also um, you know, recognized the fact that uh, that had major advantage in, in that population. So we have a separate patient management advisory board a panel for the pediatric population. And I'm also looking forward to a webinar maybe around this, this particular topic as well. So um, yeah, that's, that's again, thanks very much for, for this opportunity, uh, Frank. And, uh, and the other last point that I wanna make is also congratulate uh, the Intermax and Euromax uh, database committees for I think the groundbreaking work that they have done by putting together a database. When there's, when there's no randomized study comparing one device versus the other one, it points to the fact how important these data collections are. And the SCS is, you know, um, was the one who started with data collection, real world data. And it points uh, to um, in the direction where you think twice, is this still a device that can, um, can, that we can put safely on the market. And, and so therefore it's important data that we got out of these databases. So thank you very much for these efforts. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Bob, any concluding comments? The only, thing, the only thing I wanna say is one of our biggest challenges is the community physician. We, we recently did a survey and their impression of LVAD therapy for heart failure is still back in the XVE days. They truly believe that, that survivorship is low, that stroke rates are 20% and pump thrombosis rates are 20 to 25%. We have a big problem. And my challenge to all of you on this call is to help us figure out how to bring the most recent data to the community physician that's trying to make a decision about his advanced heart failure patient. But again, thank you, Frank. And I, I also wanna thank Intermax and STS for providing the data that you did. That was extremely helpful on the pump exchanges. And thank you all for attending. Thank you. Uh, any comments from our, our panelists? Well, I'd like to uh, thank our audience for taking the time. Uh, and I really like to extend uh, I th our thank you to the, our panelists today for taking the time and, and really providing some great insight and, and to Bob and Peter, you know, uh, taking the time to, you know, provide reassurance to our, our into our community and, and our patients. So um, I, if there's any follow-up questions, you're more than 
happy to contact one, any, any one of us. Uh, and uh, at this point, we'll conclude our, our, our webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pagani. And thank you to all of our panelists today for your participation and insight. We invite you to become a member of STS if you're not one already. You'll enjoy a variety of benefits and opportunities to help you grow professionally, plus discounts on educational offerings like these webinars. Learn more at sts.org slash membership. The STS Cardiothoracic Surgery eBook is now available for purchase online or mobile. It is the most complete and authoritative resource for CT surgical information in the world. Learn more and subscribe at sts.org slash eBook. Save the date for the next event in the 2021 STS webinar series, How to Start a Surgeon-Led Lung Cancer Screening Program. Mark your calendars for Thursday, July 22nd. Thank you for attending.